the um, Monday night, there was a meeting Pastor Asher hosted over 400 pastors and bishops that are helping us in this event, 400. And um, we provided dinner for them. <laughs> Sister Pam was laughing. We fed uh, over 400 people for $3 each in a nice banquet hall, you know. <laughs> Uh, the cost of food is not much different, but the cost of labor is much different. And uh, yet, we are so grateful for the opportunity to do it. And then I started getting a bunch of emails today from a, a guy in Lahore, Pakistan. And when I didn't answer the emails, I started getting Facebook messages, and maybe they were first. One was, I don't forget. And then eventually he switched to uh, LinkedIn. He knew I was on LinkedIn, and I knew who he was. I had already asked Pastor Asher about this guy two or three years ago. And uh, then when Sister Pam got home from the doctor, she said, hey, who is this guy? He's reaching out to me on, on Facebook. <laughs> so when I wasn't responding, he thought, well, I'll find another way in. And I told her, I said, when they, they can estimate how much money somebody from the West is investing in the events because he saw the pastor's conference the other night, so he knows how much, give or take, how much we're putting into the event uh, next couple of you know, weeks from now. And so he's, what he's saying is, you come to Lahore and do big events here too, we'll host you. Well, yeah, you'll host me because I pay for everything. <laughs> Praise God. Well, I was asking Sister Pam while we were in that first song of worship, and I apologize. I just had on my mind that uh, we've talked so much about the Magruders, in particular Sister Priscilla Magruder, the late Sister Priscilla Magruder. I was going to have them show you a video tonight, but we're not going to take the time to do that. But uh, I hope that you're enjoying them. I know there are a lot of other great quality music people out there. When you think back, I, I remember being a pastor in the 1990s, and there were still worship wars going on, not so much in the Assemblies of God or Church of God, but in other churches. And there were wars over whether they should be singing contemporary worship music or not. And one night I saw on the television a commercial for Time Life. Remember they used to have club. You bought, you bought in and then every month they sent you things, whatever it was. And one of those was worship cassettes and CDs. And they were the integrity, Hosanna integrity cassettes or CDs. And every month you got to worship. And I'm thinking here in the church we're fighting out in the world. They're making money off of us. And here we are now 20, 30 years later and everybody sings. The Catholics sing what we sing. And that's because of the Holy Spirit. It's, a, it's an absolute sign of the last day's outpouring that people, a couple, I don't remember how many years ago, I started to say a couple, but um, will I dance for you, Jesus? Will I be in awe of you? What was that song called? I can only imagine. I can only imagine. You could walk into Lowe's and it was playing on the loudspeaker in Lowe's. That didn't happen 30 years ago. And so the Holy Spirit's doing something, and isn't it interesting that, that what's happening is not some preacher, not some denomination, but worship of the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, Brother Tom Rucker was telling me he works for um, the Bishop Walsh School. And he said, now listen, not every teacher over there is of any religious value. But he said, there are, you'd be surprised. There are more than a few that are not only lovers of Jesus, but I go by their classroom and they're in there leading their kids in a worship song. And again, it's because the day in which we live. So we're right in the middle of that, and we thank God for it. We, as um, people in the Assemblies of God, I know the Church of God is the same way, four square Pentecostal holiness. We don't have a corner on this market. We want, we love it. Well, the Baptists worship in Jesus and the Methodists praising the Lord and the Spirit. We're happy. Amen. Okay, so we're, we're taking a little look at this book. It didn't, your copy or a copy if you're interested in one. I didn't get one for everybody, but um, did, they didn't make it, but it's called When the Spirit Speaks by Pastor Warren Bullock. He's from the Northwest out in the uh, Seattle region, but the book is uh, a recommended book within the Assemblies of God. He's an Assemblies of God minister, and we appreciate some of the things he said. We're not going to touch as much on his writing tonight as just a couple of Bible scriptures, okay? But we'll start reminding ourselves what it is that he's looking at, uh, chapters 1, 2, and 3, beginning to help us in his book 
to understand the vocal gifts. So in 1 Corinthians 12, we have a list of gifts, and it's what we consider to be fairly exhaustive. In other words, this is a particular list. When you talk about governments and helps and administration and, and um, uh, or some of the other ones there, hospitality, and you talk about leadership, that list, when the Bible, Peter, Paul, different ones contribute, you can tell that what they're saying is, is every believer has a gift and brings that to the body of Christ. But when we're talking about 1 Corinthians chapter 12 and those nine gifts, they are not resident in the individual believer. And we'll look at that tonight. All right? And in this, we're talking about three of those nine in particular in this study, and they are what are called the vocal gifts. There's another three that are called the power gifts, and um, uh, we won't get into those either. And, but we're going to talk about these three vocal tongues, the interpretation of tongues, and prophecy. In chapters 4 and 5, Pastor Bullock addresses two important topics Concerning these gifts, who and when. As we learn of the importance of the gifts, we also need to learn who is intended to be used in them and when they should be heard in the church's public worship services. All right? So we're going to start with looking at our private experience. Go to Acts chapter 19. This is perhaps a better text for us than even Acts chapter 2. And I'll try to help you explain what I mean by that. But for us experientially, this might be a better text because in Acts chapter 2, we have the apostles, the people who were with Jesus, the, the 12 now, you know, 11 plus they've, they've nominated or voted in another one, and also Mary, the mother of Jesus. But then another hundred additional disciples that were part of that group that followed him. They're all there in the upper room. So that's a pretty exclusive club that you and I can struggle to feel like we belong in that club. Right? But look at Acts chapter 19, verse 1. While Apollos was in Corinth, Paul traveled through the interior regions until he reached Ephesus on the coast where he found several believers. Now, he only found several believers there because Ephesus was as pagan and heathen as you could get. We read about it in the book of Acts, O great Diana, goddess of Ephesus. And if you've seen any of the archaeological pictures that from, the, from the port, the pavement went up like huge stair steps up to the temple where they worshipped her, and uh, she was obviously uh, a goddess who would, in, in the way that she was fashioned by men, she was uh, attractive to men and represented that. And so everything that comes with that was there in Ephesus. And so the Bible says that Paul got there and he found a few believers, several believers. Did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? Now, why didn't he ask them about their church membership? Or have you been tithing? Have you voted in a new pastor yet? Isn't this interesting that when Paul meets these believers, he doesn't even ask them, how did you get saved? He's about to find out. But he's got a better question. Right? You're in the middle of one of, if not the most corrupt cities on the face of the earth at that time. You are talking about Las Vegas times a thousand or uh, New Orleans at the height of Mardi Gras. You're talking about just absolute corruption and you find a couple of believers and here's the first thing you say. Did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? <laughs> well, pastor, he might have said other things. Well, it doesn't matter what he said. What Luke captures for us is what the Holy Spirit wants to know. So obviously we say that the, the Bible is inspired by the Holy Spirit, right? Mm -hmm. It's self-evident. That's what it says. The holy men of old spoke as the Spirit moved them. And so the Holy Spirit is obviously motivating, anointing Luke to capture Paul's conversation. And the part that the Holy Spirit singles out is, hey, have you now you can say, well, that's 
That's kind of selfish on the part of the Holy Spirit, isn't it? I mean, really, you should have asked a lot more questions about the blood of Jesus. Have you been water baptized? You know, do you know the Ten Commandments? Do you know the books of the New Testament in order? The Holy Spirit always wants people filled so they can worship Jesus perfectly. He doesn't fill people for his own selfish need. He doesn't have any need. He fills people so that we can worship Jesus perfectly. No angel speaking in heavenly languages can worship Jesus like the blood-bought believer worshiping in heavenly languages. Amen? They're looking right at him. You're worshiping him. You've never even seen him. Advantage you. No dog, no cat, no cow, no giraffe can worship the Lord Jesus Christ like the blood-bought believer praying in heavenly languages. No, they replied, verse 2, we haven't even heard that there is a Holy Spirit. Well, how could you not know there's a Holy Spirit? The book of Isaiah talks about him. Well, we are Gentiles. We live here in Ephesus. We got no idea about nothing except a bunch of pagan gods and idols and just garbage. That's, that's all we know. We don't know nothing about a Holy Spirit. And Paul says, what? What do you mean you've never heard there's a Holy Spirit? Then what baptism did you experience? Well, Paul, water baptism? Hello? Come on, Paul, what's wrong with you? How could you ask guys? What do you mean? You've never heard if there's even a Holy Spirit. Then how were you baptized? How, how can you be so cruel, Paul? How can you be so offensive? They replied, the baptism of John. Paul said, what? John's baptism called for repentance from sin. But John himself told the people to believe in the one who would come later, meaning Jesus. Now, the reason that Paul goes right there, I believe, is because the connection in that statement, he's quoting John. And what does John say? Now, the only way Paul knows this is by the other apostles. We've talked for a couple of weeks now about Paul being in Jerusalem early in his new life experience. And he hangs with the apostles that whole time. And so he's hearing Peter and James and John tell what John the Baptist, he was the first testimony of Jesus. This is him. And what did John say? John said, he's going to start a whole new religion. He's going to build churches all over the world. And they're going to fight. John said, he will baptize you in the Holy Spirit. John didn't even say he would save you. He says the Lamb of God takes away the sin of the world. But John said he's going to baptize you in the Holy Spirit. Because again, this was the promise from the Father. Everything we've been doing in this study revolves around that pivotal statement. This is my promise. I will pour out my Spirit on all flesh. Your sons and your daughters are going to prophesy. That's the promise, the whole thing. And John's pulling them away. See, what they keep thinking is the promises from up here in the north all the way down to the desert in the south, from the Mediterranean over the Jordan. This is, this is the land. This is our promise. And John's saying, whoa, forget it. Don't, the, the land, don't worry about the land. I, yeah, I know you had a temple there on that mountain, but he wants a temple right here in you. You won't have to go there to worship him. Because you're going to be spirit-filled and you're going to be worshiping him from the innermost part of your being. And so when we talk about John's baptism, or excuse me, John's message, his message was, that's the one that will baptize you in the Holy Ghost and fire. That's where we started five, six weeks ago, seven weeks ago. And we talked about how pivotal that was, that before we even meet Jesus, we're already hearing about the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And so these guys say, well, the only baptism we've had is John's baptism. Paul said John's baptism called for repentance from sin. But John himself told the people to believe in the one who would come later, meaning Jesus. So in other words, great, great, you're on the right trail. But you didn't even get there yet. Because John himself was telling, he was doing baptism, but he was telling of a deeper message. As soon as they heard this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. All right, well, that finishes that. Praise God. We got them straightened out, right? And Paul said, there they go. We're saved. They're water baptized. I'm going on to the next ones. How that ever happened in the Protestant church in the West, starting in Europe and then 
coming here to America. How we ever put an amen there, finish the book, close her up, and go on and do your work. I, how did that happen? Does it end there? Does your Bible, does chapter 19 end there? The story doesn't even end there, does it? Then, when Paul laid his hands on them, the Holy Spirit came on them, and they spoke in other tongues and prophesied. There were about 12 men in all. Now the story ends. Why do we end it before it ends? Why does this freak us out? Why does this put us off and make us uh, cringe and turn away? And why don't we celebrate this? And why don't we expect it and participate in it? Why don't we crave it and hunger for it? We live in the same kind of place that these guys lived. And Paul brought them step by step, not to a conclusion, until they were spirit-filled just like the day of Pentecost. Right? Okay, now, your turn. i got some questions. Why is this story recorded? And this isn't a right or wrong answer, but why do you think this story is recorded in God's Word? What are some of the reasons that we might say, oh, this is why God put this in His Word? Absolutely, it's for all. There's more than just getting saved. You can slice it and dice it however you want. They didn't have just one or two steps prior to this. They had multiple steps. They had heard, obviously, they had heard John preach or some of John's disciples preach because they didn't just say, we, uh, we, we had a Jewish experience. They said, we heard John the Baptist and we're following his ministry. And then Paul led them to the Lord Jesus Christ for salvation so they could receive the promise. It's always been about that promise. And we made two. The Father made one, and that is I'll fill you, I'll baptize you in the Holy Spirit, and Jesus made one, I'll come back for you. That's why every time somebody is not only spirit-filled, but prays in tongues, you are exercising, you are going to the bank of the Holy Spirit and you are withdrawing a little bit more of the down payment that guarantees that Jesus Christ is coming back. You are. That's what it is. It's, it's, it's the connection with heaven that's talking about how does the Bible end? How does the prayer go at the end of Revelation? Even so, the Spirit and the Bride say, even so, in the King James, come Lord Jesus. When you're praying in the Spirit, you're praying that prayer. You might be praying a hundred other things, but I guarantee you're praying that prayer. I guarantee it. It doesn't even matter whether I guarantee it or not. God's Word guarantees it. Excellent. What else? What else um, might this be recorded for? What other purposes? Brother Paul? I'm sorry. Brother Harold, go ahead. I'll get you. Yeah, go ahead and I'll get Paul. Yeah, yeah, the full gospel, right? The whole story. Yep, Brother Paul? Mm -hmm. There you go. Anemic without the power. Yeah, the, the great answers. Absolute great answers. Anybody else tonight? Why this might be recorded? Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Two different experiences. 
and it, it clearly portrays that. The other thing, too, I, I kind of thought about when we see Peter in Cornelius' house in um, Acts, what is that, Acts 10? Peter was in the upper room in Acts chapter 2, along with all the other people I mentioned, the other apostles, Mary, the mother of Jesus. But Paul was not. And it, I, I struggle. I listen from the time I was eight years old to I was 16, I was in a mainline church. And I can tell you that we avoided this. I don't remember how. I don't know what the theological arguments were. But I can tell you that we never sat down and said, you know what, this is crazy that we're not going all the way through this. But I think it's interesting that Paul, who was not there, is now shown to be doing the exact same ministry as the ones who were there. It'd be easy to say, well, Peter was kind of the end of those and uh, the apostles and that connection to the upper room. But now, and this is a popular belief, now that the church has been birthed and the message is out there, it's really just about salvation. The, the, the initial experiences were just so that the church could take root. They're not needed now. There's the cessation belief that all of the stuff that we see in the book of Acts ceased with the apostles. And that's a difficult argument to make when Paul wasn't with the original. Paul wasn't even saved at that time. Paul is um, coming in under the kind of second generation or second wave. And yet we see him ministering the very same way. Anybody else? What, how many years? The book of Acts covers 60, or excuse me, 30 years, give or take five or 10. But it's, it's coming from Acts chapter 2, which is 50 days. Pentecost is 50 days after Passover in the year that Jesus died and was resurrected, right? And so we're talking about just a couple of months after the ministry of Jesus, the physical earthly ministry of Jesus ended in his bodily form. I know that for 40 days he continued to appear. So if you want to be technical, 10 days after his ministry ended. Then we get Acts chapter 2, all right? Then from Acts chapter 2 until the end there, you've got Paul's three missionary journeys, most of which took multiple years. And uh, Corinthians is in that. And so he dies, uh, what do we think? Paul dies in the late 50s or early 60s A.D.? I'm thinking I don't really remember right now, but I think you guys can look it up. But I think that's the case. And so all of those letters take place in the, I think... The earliest letter of Paul is 54 or 5 A.D. I'm, I'm not good at that stuff, but I think that's what I remember. And the latest one they think might have been somewhere in 60. So he writes in a 10-year period there. And uh, the other guys as well. Then the Gospels come along. The collection, the writing, the recording of the Gospels are after that. And so again, Paul's doing all this. You can see why he's credited with so much legwork. Because he's not only planting these churches, he is transmitting the gospel of which he didn't see it, although he says, Jesus gave it to me personally. All right, but, but Matthew and Peter's gospel, which we think is Mark traveling with him and hearing Peter preach, we're not positive. Luke being a historian traveling with Paul but gathering the facts from all the participants. John having been there. Those guys write l later and so all of this is kind of marvelous how it's assembled by God. Brought together and yet no conflict at all. No contradiction between any of it. None of them uh, sure they all interacted and knew each other and crossed paths but they didn't spend 24-7 together. And it's amazing to see how God brought it together. Okay, here's some things we need to notice about the experience, all right? Three things, two that are here and one that's not here. So in verse 5, when Paul laid his hands on them, the Holy Spirit came on them, and they, number one, did what? Spoke in tongues, or you could say prayed in tongues. 
You could say they worshiped in tongues. You could say they gave thanks in tongues. And again, the word tongues is somewhat cumbersome for us. It comes from the Greek word, what? Glossolalia. Mm -hmm. That's the Greek word. And uh, sometimes you hear that even in academic circles, meaning languages. But for us, a better, not a word, but a phrase for it is languages that they had not been taught, nor did they learn. All right? Tongues. But languages. These are not exuberant outbursts of gibberish. These are not um, just sounds made like uh, animals out in the barnyard. This is, these are always in the scriptures identified as languages. Paul says, and this is where we get the idea of languages of angels, he says, even, even if I spoke in tongues of men or of angels... And so we will say that when somebody is praying in the Spirit, they might be praying in a language, an earthly language, or they might be praying in a heavenly language. We don't know and we really don't care. Notice the terminology I'm using when somebody's praying. Now when somebody gives a, an utterance, the gift of tongues for the entire church to benefit from, that can be different. All right, we'll get into that maybe if we have time tonight. So number one, they, the New Living says, spoke in other tongues. And number two, they what? Prophesied. Yeah, that's right. And it's interesting um, when you go back and look at Acts chapter 2, the same kind of thing happens. They all, the, the people of the city say, we hear them praising God. And so they were praying in tongues and the people were able to say they are praising God or prophesying. Prophesying is not just speaking of the future, but it's also uh, certainly praising God. But no one, there's something interesting here. There was a speaking in tongues, but there was no what? No interpretation. Mm -hmm. No interpretation. Notice that? But pastor says they prophesied, but it doesn't say there was tongues, interpretation, and prophecy. It says there was tongues and prophecy. Now that's important, I think, because it's the Apostle Paul who's writing 1 Corinthians. It's the Apostle Paul who's here in Acts chapter 19 in Ephesus. And the Apostle Paul, who later is going to say, don't let anybody speak in tongues without an interpretation in your church because it creates difficulties, it creates confusion, it creates a burden for the unbeliever. I'm dramatizing, I'm adding, I'm explaining that a little bit, but you know what I'm referring to. I think most of you understand there is a prohibition against tongues without interpretation in the church. Would you agree? 1 Corinthians 14, there's a prohibition Paul says that's not good. It doesn't work well. But here's Paul laying his hands on people, them receiving the baptism, and him not saying, whoa, wait a minute, whoa, time out. What are you doing? Whoa, we can't have tongues here with no interpretation. So obviously he's okay with this, right? Obviously that means what's happening to these individuals is different than what he's referencing in 1 Corinthians 14 when he talks about when somebody speaks in tongues, there must be an interpretation. One of the points the guy makes in this book that's really good is that for all of the non-Pentecostal charismatic churches and people that say, well, we don't do that because we believe that it brings um, disruption to the church, and we, we, only, we, we don't like it because you have to have tongues and an interpretation. We go to your churches, and there are too many times when there's no interpretation. And he makes the point, how often is there prophecy in your church? How often do you bring the sick forward for prayer to believe for healing? And he makes a really great point that all of these things that you see in 1 Corinthians 12, those nine gifts, they are expected. Maybe a better word is they're welcomed in our churches. But others spend so much time arguing against them, they never welcome them. We don't want you to become Assemblies of God or Church of God. We just want you to get into the Spirit. 
because we realize that's what he wanted for us. Does that make sense? So one of the things we do here is we welcome that. We welcome both aspects. We welcome you experiencing the Holy Spirit so that you are able to pray and worship and sing in the Spirit, to give thanks in the Spirit. Paul mentions all of those things in 1 Corinthians 14. I wanted to go there tonight, but I don't know if we're going to make it. But all of those things are mentioned as part of what happens when you experience Acts chapter 19, verse 6. You just you get all that. But when you come into the church, the Holy Spirit then, amongst all of us who are moving in the Spirit at any point in our life, daily life, weekly, praying in our own time at home or on the way to work, then the Holy Spirit, when we come together, He chooses certain times and individuals within the church to allow the nine gifts to operate. And so one day it might be you giving a message in tongues and the next time it might be you interpreting or it might be you giving a prophetic message. Well, Pastor, we don't see that very often and I agree. And I think part of what we're trying to do here is get one group of our people into a verse 7 experience or verse 6 experience to have a personal experience with the Holy Spirit that you can say on this day, I'm trying to get a hold of my mom's friend because before May gets here, I've got to know the exact day that is my 40-year anniversary. (laughs) I couldn't even imagine being 40 years old when it happened to me, let alone being the age I am now. And (laughs) and, uh, Sister Pam took real solace today when the eye doctor said, you're too young for this. That was... That was the good part. So when we, when we look back, we say, oh, I've had this verse 6 experience. The other thing we're trying to do is get everybody with a verse 6 experience to be available, to be prepared to come into the sanctuary for a 1 Corinthians chapter 12 and 14 participation. Does that make sense? Okay. Because there was no interpretation, it's permissible to assume that the word is confirming. The initial experience for the believer is a private one, no matter who might be present. These 12 guys had a private experience with the Holy Spirit. And Paul said, oh, hallelujah. Amen. He's the Jewish apostle standing there with a bunch of Gentiles who are just praising God in, in the Holy Spirit. And Paul said, oh, this is good. Paul never said, stop, whoa, this is out of order. we got to get some order here. This is uh, not, not flowing right. No, Paul said, praise God. I laid hands on you. You received. That's what we see in the book of Acts chapter 2. That's what Peter saw in Acts chapter 10. And that's what you're seeing and experiencing here in Acts 19. And he did not in any way stop, intervene, or bring correction. That's it. When we are in a public worship experience, we're to expect or require that a message intended for everyone is to be followed by an interpretation. Obviously, I mean there a message in tongues. Who might be used in this way is a decision exclusively in the Spirit's control. It is the one and only Spirit, 1 Corinthians 12, 11 says, who distributes all these gifts. He alone decides which gift each person should have. Again, If Paul felt like the guys in chapter 19 were supposed to be having a public experience, he would not have been okay with all 12 of them having the exact same gift. But what they got is not a gift for the public use. What they got was a personal, private experience. And Paul said, have at it. Now, if you 12 form a church, you come together on the Lord's Day and you're having a church service, you know, one of those real fire-breathing church services and the Spirit of God's moving, you can expect that one of you is going to be used this way in a gift and another one's going to be used that way. You're not all 12 going to have the same public gift. And as a matter of fact, you might have some services where none of you are used in a gift. And that's okay. That's up to the Holy Spirit. But privately, 
you had happen exactly what's supposed to happen. I laid hands on you, the Holy Spirit fell on you, and you all experienced the same thing that the first group experienced in Acts chapter 2, the second group experienced in Acts chapter 10, and every other group from here on is going to experience. So when should these gifts be brought forth in a public worship service? When? When is the right time for the gifts? When is the right time for the public gifts? Right? So when we, when we are subject to the Holy Spirit, right? So it's the Holy Spirit deciding. When else? When else should these gifts be used? He does a good job here, I think mostly for pastors and leaders in this particular chapter. But I think also for anybody who wants to be used, especially his vocal gifts, if there's going to be a gift of healing manifested, um, well, I even go with that. I'll stick to what I'm going to say here in a moment about when. What's happening in a service? When we're all together, say on a Sunday, what, what's happening? Tell me some of the big things that are happening in the church service spiritually. What's happening? And give me some of the descriptions of a service. Worship. Probably preaching, prayer. How are they interacting? I'm sorry? They're, they're connected and corresponding with each other. Somebody else, I heard. Orderly fashion. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So we, we use a term, Sister Pamela Chase, some of you know this, we use the term just the flow of the service. Now I'm sure non-Pentecostal churches say the same thing. Entertainers might say it. Anybody who works in front of others. But we mean exclusively the flow of the Holy Spirit, not just here on the platform, but in the congregation. What, what's happening? One of the things I struggle with Sunday morning at the end of that 11 o'clock service was I could feel an entire region of the sanctuary pulling away from me. And I don't, I, I don't, it's not that I don't like that. I know that it's not me they're pulling away from. It's, we've come to decision time, and it's not that they're run, they didn't run out the door. It's very respectful, but I could just feel a, I don't know what's happening right now. I, and I don't mean me, I mean on them. I don't know what to do with this. And so we're going to, in April, see if we can bring that together so that I have more of you who are salt and light helping to diffuse some of that. Whenever we talk about the flow of the Spirit, we're talking about Him being able then to move among the believers and to sow, weave this whole service together so that nothing's stepping on top of something else. Okay? Make sense? All right, who has a question tonight? Or a comment? I've been hoping. Mm -hmm. He makes uh, some great points in the book about what what messages are intended to do. Again, we're talking about the vocal gifts. And uh, we may later in the year talk about the other ones as well because they have just as important value to us. But these vocal gifts, um, so often they are, um, I think, misunderstood. And Brother Harold's right. He picks up several things in this book, one of which is that the importance placed on edification. In other words, it doesn't just lift us up, it strengthens us. It makes us better together. It makes us better for having been here. Amen? I hope you see, if you're here in the business meeting Sunday night, I shared some of Dr. Roden's comments from his new book about his motivation the last number of years of his leadership of our district, and it was to make sure that everybody else's uh, vision, mission, was his mission. And I, I can see myself being in that place now, too. 
And I want to make sure that when people come in here, when you come into church here on Sunday and Wednesday, that you are stronger because you were here. That you're stronger not only individually, but together. We're stronger together. But not because we got together. We're stronger together because the Holy Spirit moved among us and brought us together. Who else tonight? Comment or question? I kept you late the last couple of weeks, and I'm not going to do that tonight. Brother Paul, is that you're just waving at me? Okay. Uh huh. Right. Huh. I don't remember. Um, I'm happy. Yeah. That's right. I learned by watching others. I learned by some teaching. And he makes kind of that same point in this book that the Spirit knows when there is uh, not so much an opening, although you could describe it that way. He uses the analogy of waves, that worship might take the whole congregation to this really high place. And he says that's not the time for one of the vocal gifts. Let that, let that do its work. And when that subsides... That's that opening that you just mentioned. And it's the Spirit. So it's hard for us to, any of us to be here tonight and say, well, it should be at this time or that time. Uh, it can be at any point in the service. It needs to have some, it needs to have an aim. And that aim is to build up the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. That aim is to strengthen us, to encourage us about oftentimes messages. And Sister Pam and I have been in not only churches here in America, but around the world. And many times they, uh, they encourage us to be looking for Jesus. And that's the Holy Spirit. He always will. We, one of the reasons we've talked about the Magruders with you is because of how many of their songs were about Jesus coming back and us being ready. Just song after song after song. I don't get tired of it. I'm sorry. I don't think, I know I never will. I'm ready. I'm ready right now. Praise God. Come on, stand with me tonight. We've stayed long enough. It's been a long day for you, I'm sure it was for me. I bought new walking shoes yesterday. I was really happy with them. They feel good, but my goodness, they let my feet get cold this morning. I've never had tennis shoes let my feet get that cold. Of course, it was 25 when I started and 22 when I looped the church here and headed home, and I was like, oh, it's March. Doesn't anybody know it's March? <laughs> 22 is for January, not March. We have much to be thankful for tonight. We have much to intercede for. The work is not done. Amen? I'm not sure. Do any of you have the prayer list that I put together for Pakistan? One of the days this week, I think I put on there, pray for our visas. So um, please, what day? Oh, it's today. Oh, that worked out really great. He was supposed to send me, Pastor Asher was going to send us our letter of invitation last week, and then it was Saturday, then it was Sunday, then it was Monday, and today is Wednesday, and we got him. When I got up this morning, they were there. Um, and I get it. He's done. I'm texting him, and it's 2 in the morning over there. And then I'm texting him, and it's 7 in the morning over there. And I'm assuming it's him answering his text, or, <laughs> or he's got a really good computer. But... Um, He's not been sleeping a lot, uh, yet this is a time of great anxiety because now we're down to the last couple of things. We will be COVID tested next Friday morning um, at 8.30, and then those tests have to be negative, and we have to have the results before we get on the airplane Sunday. The Lord has assured me a couple of times that everything's fine, but I'm, and he's, he's doing that because I get really anxious at this point. And it's hard not to. So thank you for being in prayer with us about that. Okay? Who wants to close in prayer for us tonight? We had several of you open up. Who wants to uh, close out for us tonight? Brother Steve, do you mind? Go ahead.